Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, Trading Psychology and Behavioral Finance in 2016. Today's presenter is Will DeLucy. Welcome, Will. Hello. My name is Tom Hartle. <clears throat> I am CQG's Director of Product Training. I will be your host and moderator today. Before we get started, I want to mention a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the webinar, please enter them into the Q&A section window at any time. We'll have Will answer the questions at the end of this presentation. If you're viewing the presentation in full screen mode, you can find Q&A in the WebEx toolbar at the top of your screen in the drop-down menu on the far right. If you're having any sound issues, please contact the host via WebEx chat. The length of today's webinar has been expanded to 45 minutes. We'll be recording today's webinar and will be posted within 48 hours to the events section on news.cqg.com. All registered attendees will receive an email with a link to the recording. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Will DeLucy. Will has over a decade of institutional trading experience. He started Amplify Trading in 2009. He is risk manager for the Amplify team. His specialty is behavioral finance and trading psychology. He also works on the business development side, securing relationships with leading financial and educational institutions as clients for Amplify Trading. And now, Will, I'm happy to turn the webinar over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tom. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you um, for joining me on what I hope will be an interesting 45 minutes and worthwhile of your time. Um, certainly a very relevant subject in terms of the type of market activity that we've all been trading in in 2016. It's been quite phenomenal on the volatility side, and um, I'll be talking about some of the reasons why and, and how to trade in that environment. So without further ado, uh, we've got a lot of content to cover. I'm going to crack on. Um, as Tom mentioned, I founded Amplify Trading in 2008. Uh, here in London, we've got two trading floors. Um, we also have a training arm for which we won the CFA award in 2015 in the USA, and we invest heavily in training technology. Um, some of you will know our apps such as Retrader or Flow Trader Simulation. In order to understand behavioral finance, it's quite interesting to go back and look at traditional market theory. You know, what, how did people view uh, financial market activity? And there's been quite an academic debate over the decades on whether markets are efficient or whether markets are more human. Um, turn, certainly in terms if you were to do an economics undergraduate degree here in the UK, you would learn all about constrained optimization. You would learn about equilibrium models, um, Adam Smith's invisible hand, and how the market always finds the right price and quantity at which to trade. Uh, here on the left, for example, you would see the effects of an increase in price in good Y and how that might move uh, the indifference curve uh, and change the econ's purchasing decision. On a macro level, you've got the wider supply and demand curves where price and quantity clear according to the variables inputted into that model. Modern mainstream economic theory, I propose, did not fail to foresee the financial crash in 2007. According to modern mainstream economic theory, such a crash should in fact and could in fact not happen. Um, this is obviously a point of contention and not relevant to the type of financial markets in which we trade. So something else must be going on other than traditional market theory. As an introduction to behavioral finance, really we need to look at people and think about, well, how is perception of value actually formed? If perception of value, if price and value isn't a direct result of fundamental analysis, what else is going on? And very often, as I'm going to show you in this lecture, you have to take into account what other people think and try and ascertain why they believe what they believe. We're very much driven by what we read in the news, by what we see around us. Front pages in the papers like this has a stronger impact than many believe or many understand on your own subconscious and your own trading decisions. Here at Amplify Trading, I sometimes ask our trainees a couple of questions. One would be a question like this saying, according to the United Nations, what will the world population be at the turn of the century? And I'd ask our trainees to write this answer down privately, you know, hide their answer, and make sure that this is their own trade. I'd then ask them another question saying, according to the United Nations, what year will the population in India peak? But for this question, I'd allow all the candidates to see each other's answers. And what's very interesting, especially as we have a larger group here in London, is the type of answers that we get from our trainees this second question, according to United Nations, what will the world population be at the turn of the century, 
this is the individual answer. These are the trades that the candidates make when they can't see, they can't be influenced by those around them. Very often when I run this uh, example, um, the, the data is wide. The array of the data is wide from 1 trillion to 5 billion, worryingly so. In some cases, people should know or have an idea about the world population, but you can certainly see the wide array of data. For the second question, according to the United Nations, what year will the population of India peak? Now, you might actually expect these answers to have a wider array, but because as the candidates can see the other people's answers, they're saying, well, you know, the first, two, the first person has said 2022, the next person gets influenced by that answer. And even within this trend, you start to see other trends. When one candidate then might go out the box and say 2035, for example, um, the next candidate might actually say uh, a higher number than that, um, which has been influenced by the 2035. So you have 2035, 2040, 2050. Someone goes all the way out and says 2070, and then you get 2080, 2065, and you have trends within trends. What I propose to my class is very often, imagine if the first person to, to give you that answer, 2022, imagine if you thought they were an expert in their field, a Goldman Sachs energy trader, for example, and they answered 2090. How would your subsequent answers be affected? And I think in this way, people can get an idea of the strength of herd mentality and the strength of behavioral finance in markets where, as they move away from fundamental valuations. So just a basic introduction to herd behavior. This is the tendency for individuals to mimic the actions of a larger group, even though individually they might not make the same choice. And I propose it's a result of a social innate pressure for conformity. Um, we very often think if such a large group have believed such a fact for such a long time, it's unlikely they'll be wrong. A good example in oil I'll talk about in a moment. I can also talk about Daniel Kahneman as he mentioned system one versus system two. I'll introduce Kahneman in more detail later, but in all, in essence, he's saying we as people have two brains. We've got half of our brain as system one, and this is our innate animalistic response. This is um, what has kept us alive for the last 80,000 years as a race when we've heard, and when our ancestors heard a growling in the African savanna, we ran. It was innate. It was an automatic response. It's our system two, which is the human, more thoughtful element. And in a behavioral market, it's our system one that tends to really drive our investment decisions. Here's another example from Thaler in the impact or showing the strength of herd mentality. Imagine if you had to select a number between one and a hundred that was two thirds of the number of the average of all other participants. So think about this. You had to select a number that was two thirds of the average of all other participants. So how would you go ahead and do this. Well, you might think, I believe the average of other participants is 50. So what number is two thirds of, of 50? You might come into something in the, in the high 20s and give your answer as it's 27, 28, 29. But if you know that the other people being asked this question are gonna believe that you're going to take into account their expectation of the number, then actually you have to choose two thirds of 27. And then if you know that the other contestant is going to say two-thirds of 27, you have to take that into account. And in this way, the behavioral answer to this question is actually zero. If you imagine you're, everybody's thinking about what everybody else is doing. Now, when there's more uncertainty in the market and when there's less fundamental rationale, this is what's happening when you're seeing these explosions in valuations of 10% on a daily basis as everybody's trying to trade in accordance with what they think the other traders are pricing in and get onto that move before it dissipates. So this is herd behavior. Now herd behavior in 2016 and the reason for this session and this seminar really has um, got out the blocks with a flying start and it's been damaging. This is an interesting FT article just a couple of weeks ago, March the 17th saying, as hedge funds search for good trade ideas, money managers have a new source of worry their friends. Um, January and February in 2016 saw hedge funds lose on average 3% of value. And this is in a rush to move in line, and the central banks are at fault here, and we'll, we'll discuss that later too. As central banks are changing their tone from dovish to hawkish to dovish, you know, hedge funds and money managers around the world are trying to pile into the dollar weakening or the dollar strengthening trades. Now this gets very confusing because as you all know, in, in December, Janet Yellen raised rates uh, two weeks ago, she was very dovish in, his comment, in her commentary. 
Last week, all of her colleagues, uh, the FRMC members, were, had a much more hawkish tone. This week on Tuesday, Janet Yellen was very dovish again. And you can imagine how this money is flowing in and out of assets, trying to predict what other people are predicting in response to this changing tone of the Fed. It's very difficult because money managers that try to avoid the crowd may miss the early momentum of these moves, obviously then having a poor comparative performance as a result, or they might get squeezed out of a position they hold. This is what's been frustrating, I think, trading in 2016 is, you know, if you look at oil having these 10% daily swings, if you have been stopped out and then come in the next day only to find out we're 10% lower and vice versa, it can be very difficult to hold your, your nerve and your discipline. So here I'm saying in 2016, what I've seen is the shortening in the time that it takes for the market sentiment to turn on a sixpence. And there's a slightly, you might recognize this, this, uh, this graphic here, the type of moves from you know, over market panic selling, going into over valuation, valuation to the upside, the type of move that might have taken two weeks in 2016, we've almost seen on a daily basis, specifically in oil uh, and the dollar, um, S&P within the equity markets, European bank shares, you've seen these moves happen within two hours, not two weeks. Trading in this environment takes a different approach and a different skill set to risk. This is an example in oil. I'm um, using my CQG chart here. You can see I'm highlighting a move of almost 10%. And what's been interesting about 2016 is we've had these 10% intraday moves almost daily. In fact, by mid-February, 24 out of the first 26 days of 2016 saw the oil price move by more than 5% intraday. We also had record trading volumes. Many of these days had an over 10% move, but what, what's been worrying, and we all know this environment that we've been trading with, you can actually see here a number of dojis, or very close to dojis, despite 10% moves in the oil price. Now, this is a very strange market to trade in if you're getting a 10% move in the world's most widely traded commodity, yet at the end of the day, the market is finishing exactly where it opened. Let's look at some historical patterns here of behavioral finance. This is the NASDAQ over 36 months, moving from 2,000 to 3,000, 4,000 to 5,000. And if I was to say this was the, the dot-com bubble, you probably wouldn't be surprised, but actually, this is just looking at the years 2012 to 2015. What I'm trying to say by this comparison is, it's interesting, looking back in hindsight, you might very easily be able to rationalize this type of move as one of an overextension. But whilst we're in it, and whilst we're trading within it, it's very hard to identify. It's very hard to know where is the top. What can help us do that, I believe, is to look at what has happened before when we've been in these market extensions? Well, this is the NASDAQ actually in 1999 and 2000. And you can see what we had is a period of consolidation, an explosion of valuation, consolidation, further explosion towards 5,000. Before then, the market fell off in the summer. So this is back in the year 2000. The market fell off aggressively in the summer, rallied into December before continuing its momentum lower. I don't know if this rings any bells with any of you guys logged in. So we had a very bullish period followed by a weak summer, a rally then into December, followed by a continuation of, of the down move. Well, what I've got here is my CQG chart from August last year. And what I was saying about the Shanghai comp is I was trying to say, if the Shanghai comp, which is one of the most behavioral markets of 2015 and early 2016, if people are to repeat their behavior, if patterns are to repeat themselves, I wonder if you might be able to see a similarity between the stages of changes in valuation in the Shanghai comp compared to the NASDAQ. And I was saying in August here in 2015, when I took this chart, if there is to be um, a similarity in behavior of this bubble, you'll see an appreciation in prices from August to December followed by then a trend lower in the Shanghai comp, which is pretty much exactly what you've seen, especially for the first two months of the year. So behavior, patterns, and people tend to repeat themselves. Talking about whether moves have been fundamental or behavioral here, I'm looking at the Shanghai composite, which is the green line, versus the Chinese macroeconomic data. And what you can see certainly is a 2014 correlation between the Chinese economic data and the valuation of the Shanghai Composite, how people are 
how confident people are feeling about the valuation of these equities. But here in spring 2015, there's a significant divergence as the data got worse and worse, the Shanghai comp got better and better. What was happening here? Was this a fundamental move? Was this, was, was this behavioral? Well, I think it was a bit of both. The fundamental move here was on expectation of further loosening of monetary policy, further government support to try and support the equity markets, the worse the data got. So that is the fundamental reason. It was the behavioral factors, though, that really then pushed this above 5,000. And what's interesting is then when the market did start to get, when the, the People's Bank of China, when the government started to take action to support Chinese equities, in fact, the exact opposite happened and the Shanghai comp started to fall. What I'd like to propose then is what we've seen in the last few decades is three different stages of behavior. Looking back from 1980 to pre-credit uh, crunch, before central banks took this new role of market saviors, bad news was just bad news. If you had bad economic data, low GDP, if there was no inflation and high jobless rates, then risk assets such as equity indices would come under pressure. So bad news was bad news. From 2007 to 2015, this is the period that we've all traded recently, and it's been a period dominated by central bank activity. Central banks have had a new remit to do whatever it takes to support valuation of risk assets. Once they've communicated that to us, then it's quite easy to understand that bad news, poor economic data, would be good news for risk assets. You know, the worse the data got, the higher expectation of central bank action would become. Now I believe things have started to change, and you saw this in the China graph uh, just in the last slide, but we also saw this in September 2015 when Janet Yellen was expected to move rates higher, but said she couldn't because of her concerns over the global economy. Risk assets actually fell. Bad news did become bad news. And you've seen this again more recently in terms of steps that central banks have taken to loosen monetary policy because of bad news certainly has had a different effect on risk assets than we've seen over the last seven or eight years. This is going to be a big challenge for central banks, but it's a very important shift in behavior. If negative economic data will weigh on risk assets, then obviously some could say there's a long way to go. This is an excellent example of behavioral finance, I think, looking back at oil from the year 2001 to 2011. So when I started Trading all back here in 2000, 2001, for me, $20, $25 was a fair price, of course. Now, that's something called anchoring uh, here from that level. And after the first Gulf War, you have a general fundamental appreciation in the oil price. And this is a fundamental move. This is, this is the BRICS. This is China doubling in GDP, Brazil, Russia, India, significant emerging market growth through this sweet spot of the global economy. So that's what a fundamental move looks like. Now, back in 2006, I did an MSc in energy economics, and my whole thesis and dissertation was all about uh, a theory called peak oil. Will the world run out of oil? Is oil a finite resource? If the world economy keeps on growing, then surely the price of oil should be infinite. And it wasn't just me, obviously, studying this theory. This theory of peak oil really caught on, which meant that from 2007 to mid-2008, and those of you in here that have traded this find, well, remember this well. There were just no sellers in the oil market. Look at this. We went from 80, bang, to 100. Test, test, test. Just above 100, bang, 120. Just above 120, all the way up to 150. Now, this is really interesting if you think about the, the theory of peak oil or the equation, the basic equation of peak oil was growing supply, sorry, was, sorry, static or declining supply and growing demand, Okay static or declining supply, growing demand, prices have no limit. Half of that equation is on growing demand, but look at the date here. This is 2008 when it was quite clear that global demand for energy and industrial production was taking a huge hammering, which meant that even once that fundamental knowledge was known, the behavioral move in the market was strong enough to continue to push prices up to 150. So how does this kind of thing happen? Well, look at this. This is an FT article taken from late 2008, once markets have started to, to pull lower slightly. So how high are oil prices likely to go once we get through this slowdown that's underway? Arjun Murthy from Goldman Sachs believes we'll soon hit $200 a barrel. Gazprom, 250 
Dr. Robert Hirsch says oil will hit $500 in three years. Imagine whilst you're reading this, whilst you're seeing oil continue to fly higher, continue to fly higher, it's going to be very hard for you to be able to go short. Okay? And this, I think this last, this last question really sums it up. Whilst your guess is as good as mine, none of these figures seem outlandish. You know, that's the type of behavioral market that really creates bubbles in valuations when, well, it could be anything. Why shouldn't oil be trading at $500 given our view of peak oil? So here we are looking at 2016, quarter two, which we're just about to enter. Um, what have we seen so far? Well, here, yeah, this is the S&P. We've had a fall in over 13%. We've had a rally back higher in over 14%, all within a couple of months. You know, the, the, the shift in these market valuations has been phenomenal. Why has the rebound happened so quickly? Well, let's have a look at some of the reasons. A continued recovery in the oil price as one of the reasons, being oil being up 50%. That was accredited really with part of the fall. Therefore, reduced fear of U.S. energy sector bankruptcies, uh, the corporate bond market in the U.S. holding up slightly. A weaker U.S. dollar helping a rebound in emerging markets and stabilization of the Chinese renminbi. You could attribute all of these reasons to the latest recovery and risk that we've seen. However, I propose it's been more important, a change in behavior over central bank activity. Is this volatility all about central banks? Well, here we're looking at the Euro stocks volatility chart versus the ECB deposit rate. This is showing that as the ECB rate is going lower and lower, the volatility in the Euro stocks index is, is getting higher. What about this in terms of a behavioral move? So I don't know if you guys remember trading the Bank of Japan announcement back on January the 29th. The Bank of Japan announced further measures to loosen monetary policy, further measures to weaken the value of the yen, just to point out, we're looking at a chart here, yen USD, not USD yen. The Bank of Japan pointed out further uh, accommodation measures to reduce the value of the yen, and actually the opposite happened. So it's interesting to think, what's going on in the behavior here? Why on earth did the yen burst higher through this triple resistance level as the Bank of Japan took measures to weaken the yen? Well, really, this is the behavior of the market changing and saying, we don't believe you can do any more. And we don't believe even if you do do anything more, Bank of Japan, it's going to have any type of impact on inflation or any type of impact on the value of the yen. And here you can see a lot of funds getting stopped out. This is the market almost doing the opposite to what it should do fundamentally. And it's definitely the type of factor you need to take into account whilst you're trading in these markets. We saw the same on March the 10th from the ECB. So here's the ECB, Mario Draghi, delivering way more than the market was expecting. This was you know, definitely the bazooka that people were talking about on March the 10th. And initially, you did get the euro start to fall until, as we all know, who've been trading the euro since, we had a significant rally on Mario Draghi as he gave even more detail in the press conference. What I really like about this uh, commentary is here what Deutsche Bank's read says about the behavior of this market. And he says, I suppose if I was trying to explain yesterday's ECB meeting to a child, it might go something like this. Imagine you were the child and you're expecting a trip during school holidays to a caravan park, um, but instead you're given two weeks off school, you fly first class to Disney World, have a go in the cockpit and stay in a hotel full of chocolate. If the market was the same kid as the reaction yesterday, the kid would have behaved with an answer saying, okay, well that's good, but do I not get unlimited spending money? And where are we going for our summer holidays then? Now, this, is, this is how the market reacted to this is how the market reacted to more accommodation than expected from the ECB. This is the shift in behavior that we're seeing, and it's a shift in behavior that's going to only increase uncertainty over future, future central bank policy. It's not just the Bank of Japan and the ECB that are in this. Uh, conundrum. You've also got the Fed turning on a sixpence, changing their forward guidance, keeping uncertainty levels high and volatility levels high. Here you can see the Fed dot plot from March to December. So back in December, we were expecting interest rates to be in the 1.25% uh, mark um, come 2016. Now the average is looking at 075 
For 2017, we were looking at 2.5. That's been reduced to 175. These shifts for 2016 and 2017, these shifts are significant. Now, you can imagine funds pricing in rates at 125 by the end of 2016, now having to move out of those trades, um, turning on a sixpence to plow into the much lower rate environment. And then you have the kind of scenario that you had last week where you know, Fed speakers then come along and actually say the reverse of what's been communicated by Yellen. So how do you trade in behavioral markets? And we talked about, hopefully you understand you know, the, what was thought of in terms of financial theory, <coughs> efficient market hypothesis, um, optimization and equilibrium. What we're seeing now is much more volatility, much more behavioral moves as uh, funds flow much faster trying to get hold of any advantage that they can. How would you be able to trade in this uh, type of environment? Well, I feel very strange saying this because throughout my career, I've always had technical analysis quite low down in terms of importance. But what we are seeing in this type of market environment, as we move away from fundamental rationale, technical levels are becoming much more important because what else do you really have to go on? So in behavioral markets, I say traders need to increase the weighting of technical importance even when they're convinced of their fundamental view. So here I'm looking at the technical type of patterns that we've seen in 2016 and how important they've been. I'll only touch on these very briefly. The double bottom in the S&P. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are looking at the Fibonacci retracement from the 2015 high down to the 2016 low. And you can see how important these Fibonacci levels have been for the S&P during this whole period of recovery. And I assume you know how important 2100 will be. Oil, incredibly behavioral this year. Um, double bottom in oil at $26, pretty much spot on. And you can see how oil has reacted around the handles, 36, 39, 42. It's not by coincidence that oil's really using these nice round numbers in these behavioral markets to ascertain value in terms of being overbought or oversold. So what can you do here in terms of an exit strategy? Well, what I advise my traders here in Amplify Trading is just try and be more pragmatic in terms of when you're taking risk off the table. You know, when you're getting these very uh, sharp moves and reversals, if you can be more pragmatic in booking profit earlier than you might have done otherwise on at least some of this position, I think you'll be in a much better position because when and if the market does reverse incredibly sharply, you're really getting away from the problems of prospect theory, which I'll talk to you about. So the second way to trade in these behavioral markets is self-awareness. And here I'm going to get on to a bit more trading psychology. Now, some of you out there might have heard of prospect theory. Daniel Kahneman won the, uh, the Nobel Prize for this in 2002. And this is talking about how we are not efficient um, in terms of valuing money and valuing our trades. I'm just going to draw a line like this, for example. And what we have here is what Daniel Kahneman is saying is that as you continue to make gains away from what you were expecting, the further the gains away from your normal return, you can see here the diminishing scale of return. Let me give you an example. So let's say you're expecting to make $5,000 on any one day out of your trading activity. And out of that $5,000, you would get a value on this vertical axis of 7 out of 10. Let's call it happiness, your 7 out of 10 happiness once you've reached $5,000. What this flattening of the curve shows you then, if you move from $5,000 to $6,000, doesn't actually change too much in terms of how you feel. So that $1,000 above $5,000 is worth less to you than the $1,000 from zero to $1,000. Okay? Now, if we were efficient wealth maximizers, our line would look more like this yellow line where every increase in the gain would have an increase in our perception of wealth and our perception of achievement. But that's not happening. What's happening here is we hit a certain point of satisfaction, and after that point of satisfaction, you see a diminishing returns to scale. Now, the reason why that's important in market volatility is because as you move out in terms of these, you know, exceeding your expectations, let's say you're in a long oil position. If you aren't booking any of this trade, if you aren't taking out any of the risk here, then very, very quickly, how you feel about this position as the gains dissipate can leave you feeling very disgruntled and frustrated. Now, it's not only the 
money lost on that particular trade that's the problem. But psychologically, then, you're in a very different space thinking should have, would have, could have. Why didn't I? I can't believe it's reversed so quickly. I didn't take anything out of that trade. And subconsciously, that can affect your next trading decision. Looking at on the negative side, Daniel Kahneman's pointing out you feel losses much more strongly than you feel gains. So this line, the vertical line, is steeper. But again, what's more important here is this line starts to flatten out. So let's say if your threshold was normally losing $3,000, you didn't want to lose more than $3,000. So all the time losing $1,000, that hurts, $2,000, you know, you feel it, you're recognizing the pain, and $3,000. But as you get over here to $9,000, $10,000, how different do you feel losing $12,000 to $10,000? I propose that that $2,000 between 10 and 12 is actually worth a lot less to you than the initial $2,000. You start to feel it a lot less. This sort of behavioral finance, this trading psychology shows itself very often, certainly in our new traders. It's my job to try and arrest somebody's fall here, talk to them, help them breathe, and help them refocus to get back into this area of focus and, and, and profitability. If you allowed this just to slip, then you might be, well, you might have heard about the UBS trader, Queco Adeboli, um, a few years ago here in London. You know, he was $100 million down, went to $200 million, half a billion, uh, $2 billion loss, and he finally got stopped out at $2.7 billion. You know, once you've, once you've lost $2 billion, what's, what's, what's losing $2.7 billion? All right, I'm not suggesting you do that or try it. It's just an idea. Let's give an example of this. How does it work? So... Let's say you're offered two, two sessions, A or B. Option A, would you like to get $10 million with certainty? Or option B, would you like 50% chance of getting $25 million? Now, we all know that option B is worth more. 50% of $25 million is worth more than 10. But I put it that most of the people here in this room would actually choose option A, a secure profit. Option B, A or B here, would you prefer a jail sentence of 10 years? Um, or a 50% chance of serving 25 years. Now, let's say option A, a guaranteed jail sentence of 10 years. When faced with loss in this way, a lot of people would actually be more akin to take risk when the loss gets too big. And this is the thing about these behavioral markets and this type of volatility. If I was to change this question around and say, you know, would you have prefer to do one hour's worth of community service? Or would you take a 50% chance to do 1.5 hours worth or 2.5 hours worth of community service. People would be able to say, well, one, one hour of community service, it's a loss, but it's a loss that I can take. I'll secure that loss. But when the loss gets too big, very often we get frozen. We can't secure that loss, and now we look to take extra risk just at the exact wrong time. Trading in these type of markets, you need to be able to manage yourself when there's the difference here between what should happen and what does happen. If you've got uncertainty and risk maximized, this is certainly when I started as a new trader, you could never really tell who was going to be successful in the end. It was all about that person's character and their ability to manage themselves in this area of uncertainty. Taking full responsibility for risk decisions made under pressure with an, uncertain, with an uncertain environment can lead to an incredible discovery of self. Now, I know that sounds very touchy-feely, but it's absolutely true. What do we measure here at Amplify Trading on our traders? Well, we've got our own statement tool. We're developing our new heat map. And this is what's important to us for our traders. Well, let me start with the most important, variance resilience. What do I mean by this? Here, we're looking at what is the ability, well, let's say you've got uh, your standard deviation of trades. I'm looking for how does the trader respond after an experience that moves away from the standard deviation of the mean. So let's say if you're used to making $500 or losing $300, that's what you're used to and that's your average. But on one particular day, you lose $3,000. I'm really interested in your next day. How do you respond to that abnormal event? Or on the positive side, how do you respond after a trade that goes particularly well? Uh, pragmatism, what is the ability of the trader to put profit or take the loss close to trade potential? So what we're interested in is how close to the ultimate position for that day are you able to, to book most of your position? Discipline, deviation of return, trader's equity curve over time. All of these variables 
need to be measured. And we believe they need to be measured because if you can measure something, you can manage it. This is about trying to measure our traders' personality, our traders' character, what actually makes them tick. So why is that important? Well, just to note, there's a lot of other psychological barriers to performance, which I won't have time to go through here. Confirmation bias, loss aversions, endowment effect, anchoring, and hubris. If you do want any of these uh, slides or detail on these factors, I'll be happy to email them to you. Let's have a quick look, quick look at this chart. This is one of the traders, uh, one of my traders, talking to me about his S&P trade. Now, I, I know some of you would have experienced this, so we can feel his pain for a little bit. Um, there he is, his trading. I think he was trading five contracts in the S&P. He was trading five contracts in the S&P, so you know, relatively small and a relatively new trader here. Non-farm payrolls comes out worse than expected. The S&P moves lower. He sells his full five contracts here. Okay. The market then starts to whip back up. He doesn't take it off. He doesn't take it off. He doesn't take it off. And now he starts moving his stop higher, starts moving his stop higher, stop, doesn't take it off and survives. Watches the S&P come all the way back down. And he takes his five contracts off pretty much where he sold it in the first place. I don't know if anyone in this room has been through such an example. Look at what he writes to me here. This is at 2.30, an hour after the event, so just after he got out. Let me introduce new Paul. Until 1.30 p.m. today, I was a young 32-year-old alpha male. Now I'm about 85 and trembling. Thanks, non-farm payrolls. Here's his other message to me. That was absolute torture. Look at his language here. That was absolute torture. Massive gamble to hold and shift that stop so wide. Have you ever done that before on paper? This is the terrible word he's using. I was sure we would get back to 1380. Torture, gambling on avoiding getting squeezed out. Now, this type of market volatility is what we're having to get used to. And what it shows is, well, the, what, he did the worst thing here. By moving his stop and surviving in this case, this trader's days were numbered because it means he got away from it. He got away with it. So he only has to do it one more time. The market continues going in that direction and has lost everything he ever made. It also meant that he sat and looked at the screen and just watched as the market over for the rest of the whole day fell, 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 moving lower, lower, lower. He couldn't take advantage of it. He was frazzled. This is just what you should not do. You should have the discipline, get out, be flexible, and be there to trade when the momentum's in your favor again. This is the sort of volatility you guys will be getting used to this year. As you all know, it's stressful. I want to talk to you a bit about stress. Here I'm talking about System 1 and System 2 of Daniel Kahneman again. When you're stressed, when we're engaged in this type of market volatility, the blood is moving away from the outside of our cortex into the center, into the fight or flight mode. Very, very quick and very, very irrational decisions are being, being made here. How can you recognize that? Well, for some people, you need to try and recognize where you perform at your best. So for me, as an activist, something I'll talk about in a moment, I perform much better in this area. Okay, I, I, I like stress, I like fast moving markets, but for all of us, the longer that you're operating at this high level of focus, the more potential you'll have to lose that focus, to get tired, and then be like a rabbit in the headlights when volatility is in front of you. If there's not enough stress, for some of us guys here, if you're in this case, it might be the case that you have to stay away from the market and not over trade in quiet market activity. I'm gonna skip through this slide at the moment. What you need to do is understand your trading style. So what I'm proposing here is that your personality, in this, in this type of example, your personality is locked. Well, it's not locked per se, but it's certainly more static than your behavior. And your behavior oscillates around your personality. It's important you try and find out what is your style, what type of market environment do you perform better in, understand your behavior, not to, not to control it, not to change it necessarily, but to better manage it in accordance to the market environment in which you're trading. So with increased volatility and uncertainty, traders may question their performance and try a new approach or strategy, change that, try a new approach or strategy. I'm sure some of you know that. And you can begin to feel lost and you can begin to lose confidence in what you do. Has the danger that you're moving away from your natural style. I don't want our traders to fight their unconscious personality. So what do I mean by this? Well, here I'm proposing there's four different personality types. So the activists are quick to act. They like energy. They like excitement. 
reflectors, they review, they take in information. Theorists are much more thoughtful, they're using system two, and pragmatists would be very goal-driven. What I propose here as a trader is trying to work out what type of personality style you are, and I'm happy to send you the questionnaire on request if you'd like this. It'll only take you 10 minutes to fill out. Once you've worked out for me, I'm absolutely an out-and-out -out activist. So what does that mean about my trading? Well, it means that I get bored incredibly quickly. It means that I'm impulsive to a fault. It means though I'm also very optimistic and very confident and very willing to take risks. So those are good things that I don't wanna, I don't wanna lose. However, not every type of market environment suits my style. In fact, it's only really volatile major news events that I feel comfortable trading with with any size. When the market environment for me is much slower, I have to make sure I can bring in some of the theorist and reflector strength. So I need to be able to try and encourage myself to take more thought over my actions, to be more conservative, or more respectful of a sideways trend that's in place, okay? It means that you have to be able to bring in the other skill sets. So for me, as an activist, actually, um, it always helped me. I've always been an activist, and you always will be your personality now, anyone that's logged into this. You're not going to change the kid that holds the kite. But you can certainly change how the kite flies. For me, it was very important sitting next to I spent my whole career sharing a desk with Piers Curran, our head of trading, who some of you might know. I would say he's an out-and-out -out pragmatist in terms of goal-driven money management, focus on results. So for me as an activist, it was very helpful growing and building my career next to somebody like that because I had to take on those qualities that didn't come to me naturally. How can you build on this? Well, here we're looking at club cycle and what you can do, an activist would get stuck here in terms of experience, experience, experience. You need to be breathe and be focused enough and cognitive of who you are enough to then review what you're doing, what is going well, what is going poorly conclude and implement. Experience, review, conclude and implement. This is, the, the, you can only grow as a trader when you're going through this. So in this new volatile market environment that you're experiencing, review the intraday daily swings may be too high. You may be getting stopped out only to see the market reverse. Conclude, you'll need to adjust your trading style. Is it that you're to stay out of markets during economic data? Is it that you're only gonna start trading during the less volatile periods? And then you need to implement this, experience what that's like, review, make your conclusions and implement. By going through this cycle every day, every trade, you'll be able to develop as a trader and benefit. Okay, guys, well, that was a very quick review, um, just 45 minutes in terms of a background to behavioral finance and hopefully some advice in terms of how to approach these more volatile markets um, a tiny bit in terms of technical and the more important uh, focus on technical analysis in such market volatility. But then the main second part of the lecture was about self-awareness. Knowing yourself in this heightened market volatile environment really can help you focus on the results and trade the market in accordance to the environment. Um, I know I've got a few questions here and I'll be able to go through them and look at the chat bar. So from now for the 45 minutes, I hope you I have enjoyed that, but let me go to the chat and I'll see if I can get through some of these questions now. Okay, here we go. So in the chat, um, yep, okay, you guys are all in. What kind of company are you? Uh, so we've got three different arms. So this is from Metin. Um, we've got three arms. We've got uh, just under 40 proprietary traders here at Amplify Trading in London. We also run training and development for corporate clients, which include asset managers, um, sovereign wealth funds, and we run some of the graduate programs for the largest global investment banks as well. Uh, we also, in terms of the training and development, do take individuals on in London here to go through our program to train with our mentors. Um, our third arm is in technology. So we invest quite heavily in trying to bridge the gap between what should happen in financial markets and what does happen uh, these would include, there's a free app you can download called Retrader um, on the App Store or Google Play uh, where you can retrade major market events. Take a look at that. We've got a number of different simulations that our clients use both on the buy side and the sell side. We're not a broker. No, we're not a broker. Um, if you'd like to join our training, by all means, please do check our website. Uh, do you offer a job after this? Uh, Zheng, you're, you're saying absolutely if you're trading our, our funds. 
Um, Thomas asked about herd mentality here. Does this mean that normal herds are usually optimistic, seeing the two examples sentence in profit? Very interesting question. No, it absolutely doesn't. In fact, I would say that herds can be more powerful on the negative side. You know, when you start to receive negative news, as we saw, you know, 2007, 2008, 2009, um, or when you look at the, you know, the fallout of the dot-com crash or the fallout of oil, it's a herd move on the upside. But when that herd turns, it's also a herd move on the downside. Okay, uh, excuse, David. Excuse me, Will. Yep. Um, this yes. is Tom. Uh, yeah. Hi, Tom. And um, some people aren't quite sure about uh, CQG's uh, part in all of this. So if you want to just take a Absolutely. five seconds to so, talk about CQG. Thank you, Tom. So what we do with CQG at Amplify Trading, all of our training here is with CQG. So we've been going now for seven years, and CQG have provided all of our trainees with three different types of platform. We've used CQG Trader, CQG Q Trader, and when our guys go live, they use CQG Integrated Client. I talked to you guys a bit about the performance assessment tool. Do you remember when I mentioned about how we look at variance resilience, how we look at um, discipline, trading side? Now, we use CQG for that because every time one of our trainees clicks the mouse, every time one of our trainees makes a decision, we receive data from their decision. We are able to download that and create a statement report and a skill heat map, um, which, is, which is excellent. The CQG have been very helpful with that. Also using CQG, we've got about 30 partnerships with business schools and universities worldwide. We won the CFA Award for Innovation in Financial Education using the CQG platform at Stirling University in Scotland. Um, again, this is where we'll go to a university and, and change their computer cluster into a trading floor. Every student has used full use of the CQG platform um, under our guidance. So it's been a, yeah, I, thank you, Tom. It's been an integral part to our business um, for the last seven years and hopefully, hopefully counting. So yes, uh, there's a question here. CQG and Amplify Trading are two different types. That's right. Amplify Trading, we're a proprietary trading company as well as a training organization, but CQG, the system is integral to everything that we do. Um, so hopefully that explains a bit about it. Okay, okay. Some, is, is that okay, Tom? Uh, yeah, no, that's great, thank you, go ahead. Okay, so some other people are being asked to email the lecture slides. Uh, yes, I did whip through them, didn't I? So absolutely, I can, I, I can send those to you. Um, and then, Bevnesh, you're asking, how do I think behavior in the industry as a whole uh, will change with the strides in fintech. Well, yeah, I mean, I think fintech is incredibly important. We, I mean, I remember trading, you know, back in the early 2000s, really before algos affected markets. And one of the biggest changes with fintech has been the reduction in arbitrage opportunities. You know, certainly when I started, you had seconds to trade a correlatory pattern between uh, German bonds and U.S. T notes. And I think that's still going to be the case. I think. The fintech element is really affecting more sell-side operations, I'd say, in terms of investment banks unwinding risk or market making. Um, but yeah, who, who knows where this can go? The only thing I can say is you've got to go with it. Every trader that I know that would moan and complain about uh, HFTs or algos in the market pushing prices away uh, would absolutely suffer. Um, you've got to be able to take the, ch take the change and, and psychologically deal with it and trade with it rather than against it. Um, one more question, and related to the discussion to DB Read, uh, is the uncertainty due to the central bank? Well, what tools are the central banks left with to combat issues with uncertainty? Well, very interesting tool <laughs> discussion indeed. There's, there's one main tool that's left, of course, which is called helicopter money. Helicopter money for the ECB would literally mean uh, Mario Draghi going up to every person in the European bloc and handing them thousands of euros and telling them to spend it right away. That's pretty much the main big option left. Of course, they can extend QE. They can do another round of QE. They can go into further negative rates, but they're not too far away from helicopter money as it is. Uh, Zheng, okay. how do we... Oh, is that okay, Tom? Yeah. I, well, you gonna, um, was there one more you are going to do then? I was just going to ask uh, from Jen, how do we know what the normal herd think and how do we make sure we think differently from them? I want to be very careful on this question, Jen. You don't necessarily want to think differently from the herd. You know, it depends when you start thinking differently from the herd. For example, you could have said in, you know, 1998 that uh, dot-com stocks were overvalued. It would have taken a further two years for you to have been proven right. 
I think it's more importantly, it's more important to understand why do the herd think what they think. If you can conceptualize that, then it doesn't mean that you have to be right or wrong. It means that you can then choose whether to go with the herd or whether to wait for the retracement. Okay, so that's it for now, I believe, Tom. Okay. Well, I want to say thank you very much for a really fine presentation. I think there was a tremendous amount of value to it, and I'm sure all, all of the uh, participants are going to get a lot out of it. Um, again, thank you. I want to say uh, any unanswered questions, we can forward them. Um, as I mentioned at the start, this webinar was recorded, and you'll receive a link to it, and it's also on our YouTube channel. So, again, thank you, Will, and everyone have a good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Take care. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.